let's welcome Reverend Dr. Chan An Chen. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, can be here or there. Uh, this church, you've got to navigate your way up. Uh. <laughs> Praise God. How I wish I can see all your faces at the back, but I can't. But nonetheless, we'll be seeing each other. Amen. Okay, uh, again, uh, thank you, Pastor Gideon, uh, for the kind invitation to be able to preach the Word of God. Uh, we have friends here, uh, Pastor Peter, Pastor Nihao, Pastor Sharon, and of course, uh, I just started teaching also. There are some uh, that is right now in my class on local church admission uh, in BCM. Now, before I share with you the Word of God, let me just, uh, can, can we have the slide on? Uh, let me just i got to do three, three things uh, before I forget anything. Number one, I want to say thank you for Judy Klang because this is one of the churches that's been very supportive of the AOG churches in Sabah. Okay? I don't have the slides up, but really it's because of your help that we're able to expand. Now, of course, not only your help, there are also so many other churches. Okay? Uh, but but you've got to take part of the credit. Uh, right now in Sabah, we're having something like what? Official, official church is actually only about 30 plus. But including the unofficial, all in, we are running about 80 churches. Okay? So it is growing, but we have got to put the organization, uh, we have got to put the administration uh, in place. Now the second thing is, is to make sure that, or else my wife is going to scold me later if I forget. Now, uh, we have also brought some handmade cards by Orang Asli, uh, uh, made by some Orang Asli ladies, and I believe it's downstairs, okay? My wife has a project where we help a couple of uh, Orang Asli ladies uh, to, what you call it, supplement their income, so they make some very lovely handmade cards. Uh, normally, this is sold uh, in a couple of, sh is it two shops? two shops in Kuala Lumpur, but since I'm preaching, might as well bring them here, so we remove the, uh, what do you call, the middleman, and so we can give them a, a bigger profit. Those are really lovely cards. Go downstairs uh, and uh, have a look, okay? Now, at the same time, now, now that is my AOG hat, that's my husband hat. Uh, the other hat that I'm wearing is as Asia CMS Executive Director. I also brought in some magazines and flyers, I believe that the ushers, we have a limited number, just feel free, take it for free, find out more uh, through our website, okay? Now, what I want to do today, uh, over the next half an hour is this. I want to talk about living our life, or living out our missional identities. And I'm going to do a study of our X chapter, oh, sorry man, wrong text. I put in early this morning, uh, Acts chapter 11, but don't worry about it. But what I want to do is this, before I even go into the text, I want to share with you some good news, and I want to share uh, basically some stories, uh, because today I really am going to be telling a lot of stories, okay, because uh, now I can teach Bible, but your pastor is your Bible teacher, okay, so I'm not going to be the Bible teacher here. Now, you know, as I've been serving God through the years and I've traveled, and one of the things that I realize is this. Today, we are actually living amidst the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Amen? Okay, now before we carry on, we forgot to pray. Shall we pray? Let's pray. Father, we're just simply excited. We thank you that you're here. Lord, as I think the next half an hour... Uh, to share. I thank you for the Holy Spirit who's here, oh God, that you're going to take what I'm saying, touch it into different hearts. And Lord, even for individuals here, oh God, there's also going to be direction, a redirection of their lives, also a deepening of their commitment and a deeper understanding of where they are in you. Father, we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, uh, let's carry on. Now, as I was saying is that the kingdom of God is advancing, and right now, I can tell you this. There is no country in the world where there are no Christians. Okay? But not only is that true, 
for those of you who became Christians in the 1970s, the number of Christians in Asia has more than doubled in that last, from 1970 until now, how many years? Huh? 50 years, just short of 50 years. Because in the entire Asia, in 1970, the statistics was 4.5%. Right now, Christians in Asia, we are talking about 9%, okay, and it's growing. And even though Christianity is a minority faith, but yet it is exploding, and let me just share with you, and a lot of this growth is not just transfer growth, it is conversion growth, and Pastor Lydia herself is an example of that. Okay, now I can't tell you all of the stories, but let me just share just a few. Okay, uh, number one, when you look at these faces, this is not Kunming, okay? I know they look Chinese, but they are not Chinese. The church is exploding in the nation of Mongolia. Why? In 1990, most of you here born already, right or not? In 1990, there was, as far as records is concerned, there were only 3,000 Christians. Today, you're running at about 60,000 plus. Okay? It is actually that fast. In other words, just in 1990, what you see in that building, the church, you will not even see it there at all. So, in other words, what did not exist just less than 1990, uh, less than 30 years ago, you're seeing it happen right before your eyes. Another church, another country where the church is exploding is frankly Nepal. Okay? Now, in 1951, now anybody here born before 1951? God also, 1951 or? Okay, God. I, I wasn't born yet. In 1951, there was zero recorded Christian, officially. In 1961, I was one years old, 458. But in the year 2001, it has jumped to 102,000. And right now, it is anywhere between 1 to 3 million. In fact, when I paid a visit, I was shocked. They told me in Kathmandu alone, uh, when you talk about Bible school, three months, six months, one year, uh, one year, two year, three year, four year, five year program, there are at least 100 Bible schools in Kathmandu. Way more than Klang Valley. Okay? And I also visited our AOG Bible school and I found out Nepal now has got 1,000 churches. Bigger than us already, Pastor Gideon. How, ah? Uh? We, we, we got to play catch up, man. Literally, it's exploding. But not only that, what is happening is that that mission vision in an Nepali church have started to explode. So they are not only just sharing the gospel, but they are looking into the needs in the community. And when I was there, they took me to this slum that is right beside the river that runs through Kathmandu city. And in the summer, it is smelly. Education is not enough. And right in the midst of the slum, you know what I find? There's a Christian school. Education for the poor. Opened by the Nepali Christians themselves. So it is not just conversion, but we are seeing the growth. And recently under Asia CMS, uh, one of our partners is actually an AOG person. We are going to have our very, very first Nepali woman to do her PhD at the Oxford Center for Mission Research. And she's going to be teaching at our Nepali Bible College. Okay? So this is just sheer incredible growth. Okay? Let me talk to you also right now about another, about, now one, one more part about this Nepal. Now the amazing thing about this Nepali thing is this. The growth is not just because of missionaries going inside Nepal, but it's also because somehow God has intertwined people from Dubai, UAE, Malaysia, and overseas, and their lives get changed. I met up these two gentlemen, and the brother on, my, on the left, his name is Santosh. 
He's right now the principal of the Nepal Baptist Theological Seminary. And he also sits on the board for the Asia Graduate School of Theology in Nepal. Then when I met them last year, I asked Santosh, how do you receive Jesus? He told me 2003. You know where? Bataling Jaya. He came here as a migrant worker. But somehow, people reached him. And the church that he went to nurtured him. I don't know how good it was his English, but right now, he is very articulate. He did his bachelor's in Malaysian Bible Seminary and his master's in uh, Penang Baptist Theological Seminary. Okay? He is a Malaysian product. Okay? And one of these days, they are going to be GT, G, GTP, uh, GT Clank products. <laughs> okay? I'm not talking about Napoleon alone, but real, the reality is right now, we are having all kinds of people, uh, all ethnic groups in Malaysia, and when we begin to see this happening, you realize that God is the God of the harvest. Amen? Okay? Now, let me, uh, let me just talk about one more country. After, otherwise, I end up telling too many stories and nothing else. Uh. Okay? Now, in the month of March, I went to do a mission conference. Uh, by the way, if you are videoing this, uh, uh, try to avoid the faces, okay? <laughs> I, I don't want to be faces up to be on uh, social media. Now, I was uh, in this country uh, just south of China. I was, uh, I was doing a mission conference. But after the mission conference, what happened was this. My host drove me to this village and I was all the time checking it on my Google map. And finally, when we reached there, I realized we are just two hours from the Guangdong border. But what was more interesting was this. Suddenly, we came to this area. This whole area was all Christian. It's a tribal group. And then, lo and behold, I saw this church. You know how many they sit or not? 1,000. Bigger than you, la. <laughs> bigger than this place. 1,000. And I was thinking to myself, how in the world did this happen? They told me the story after World War II. Missionaries came in from the States. It took me three hours drive by comfortable road, SUV, nice car. But I could just imagine after World War II, what kind of roads you have in those places. Probably you have no roads. They made their way. But simply because of the work of the Holy Spirit inspiring people, today there is a thriving church in, in this area of Vietnam. Okay? But not only that, the numbers are not big, but, re, but this year, Asia CMS, we initiated at the behest, at the request of the people there that to do actually a cross-cultural missions training. Because you know what they're saying? That right now, it's time for the Vietnamese church to rise up in church planting, in missions. Because they say, in the past, you only can do mission if other people come or if other people give the money. But now, we want to talk about, let's have Vietnamese money, let's have Vietnamese people, we are going to get it done. Amen? So, this is something that I'm seeing again and again happening. And let me just backtrack. I'm actually requested from the largest church in Pokhara, uh, 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 in Nepal, because this is with our, part, with our partners, to actually next year, we are trying to fix up a cross-cultural mission training. Because, are, you know, the Nepali Christians right now are talking about how can we take the gospel further? Not just reaching our own kinds of people, but right now you're having the Nepali church rising up and saying that we got to be involved. And they're making plans. They have their limitations, but they are making plans and they're saying, let's go for it. Now, why am I saying, telling this story? It is because I want to illustrate some things. By the way, where is the clock? Ah? Oh, there it is. I want to make sure that I don't shoot past my timer. Ah? Okay? 
And, uh, oh, there's one more thing. Now, right now, I want to share with you a very brief sharing from the Word of God. But before I do that, uh, let me just uh, shoot to you because people ask me, hey, uh, Pastor Chan, what do you do in Asia CMS? Uh? Uh, if I'm going to tell you, next half an hour. So the best thing is, let's have the video, three minutes. Can we do that? Now, you know, as, now back to the slides, you know, uh, I was tapped to lead Asia CMS uh, just a little bit less than two years ago. But one of the things that excite me as I've shared with this couple of stories is this. We are actually living in very, very exciting times. I remember when I first became a Christian in 1975, our churches were small. And I remember visiting uh, G.D. Clang. During those days, I got ISCA and CA. You don't have this building uh, at that time. It was just a wooden house. But what we are seeing is the incredible growth financially, spiritually, theologically. But we have to understand that we are right now entering a new season. And that season is, has got to do with the rising up of the Asian church, or may, uh, more specifically right now, the Malaysian church, and even more specifically, GD Clang, into what God is doing in this next phase and next season. And I wanted to right now uh, take us to my key text today, uh, which is taken from Acts chapter 11, verse 19 to 26, where it talks about the growth of the church of Antioch. That those who were scattered because of the persecution that ar arose over Stephen travel as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except the Jews. But some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists also, preaching the Lord Jesus, and the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad. He exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. And let me just go to the last part. For a whole year, they met with the church, and they taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Now, what I want to do right now over the next 10 minutes is simply to explain this, okay? Uh, I, I put it on print. First of all, I think that as all of us are believers, we have to realize this. Every single one of us have a dual identity. First of all, all of us have a natural identity to a great extent, you didn't choose it, although you have certain choices. Uh, why I say you didn't choose is this. You did not choose to be born a Chinese. Anybody here chose or not? Okay, even your parents didn't choose. No choice. Okay? All of us have a natural identity by virtue of our natural birth, circumstances. You, some of you grew up in Klang. And Klang, Hokkien, Bakute, business. That's who you are. It's got to do with your social economic background, whether you're Chinese or you're Indian. Uh, when Chinese marry Indian, then you have mix. Okay, those are where we make some choices. So, on one hand, all of us, when I ask, who are you? You're going to say, I'm a male. Where are you from? Clang. I mean, those are natural things. But what we also need to understand as I bring to you across the, with the word of God is that all of us also have a spiritual identity which is missional and there's a drive and that has got to be lived out. When you receive Jesus into your heart, the Holy Spirit comes into you and interpenetrating into your natural being your natural identity intertwined is a missional identity and a, a, a missional drive that comes from the Holy Spirit. This comes from the Holy Spirit sent by the Son of God who came to earth on a mission to die 
for our salvation. And the Lord Jesus himself, in turn, was sent by his heavenly Father, who is God of all creation, and who is God on a mission to redeem humankind and to redeem all creation. This is a part that I pray that by the end of today, you're going to be able to catch. Because there is, whether you realize it or not, something within you, which I term as a missional identity and drive, and that has to be expressed out, and that has to be lived out. Now, let me just, you know, sometimes it's very difficult to express, and this one is a little bit more scholarly. Uh, the scholar, the mission scholar, Bevins and Schroeder, made this statement. He says this, through a reading of the book of Acts, the church only emerges as the church, really rises up to its identity as a church when it becomes aware of its boundary-breaking mission, not just to Judaism, but to all people, not just to Jerusalem and Judea, but to Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The church is missionary by its very nature and it becomes missionary by attending to each and every context it finds itself. Okay, now this is basically what I want to talk about today and I just want to illustrate it from scripture and from stories, okay? First, let me just kind of illustrate it from scripture. This, the example of the early church. Now you know very well when you study uh, Bible history, that command where in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, they says that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem to Judea, to Judea and to the uttermost part of the earth. They received that and when the Holy Spirit was poured out in Acts chapter 2, what happened was this. People were excited. And what happened was naturally they shut the gospel and the church exploded. But they never went out of Jerusalem. And also, it was basically among their own kind of people. That means Jews to Jews. Now, we know that Jesus gave that command, but how often does it happen that we read Scripture, yeah, through, but it kind of uh, goes in here, but it doesn't register, or we hear, <laughs> it goes in here, and it comes out here. But you see, God has His way of making things change. And what happened was that they stuck around in Jerusalem for at least, uh, at least nearly 10 years until Acts chapter 8, where persecution broke out. And what happened? They got to sell off their property. They got to chabut. They got to go elsewhere. But yet in the midst of that, finally what happened in Acts chapter 11, the Bible tells me that those who were scattered now, even though they had to rebuild their life, restart their business, but there was a fire still burning. And what happened is this, they shared the gospel. And of course, human being humans, you always share with those people like your own kind. Lah. Jews to the Jews, Chinese to the Chinese, bananas to bananas. You know what I mean? Okay, AOG churches in Malaysia in the 60s, 70s were basically banana churches. Correct or not? Because we were English educated. But somehow, the Spirit of God began to move and the Bible tells me that they started speaking to the Jews. And the Spirit of God moved, uh, sorry, to the non-Jews, to the Greeks. And that created a whole new dynamic which required them to change. Okay? Because suddenly... You have all these Greeks coming to church. And by the way, when you start to have other kinds of people coming to the church, you've got a problem, you know. You know why not? Jews don't eat pork. All these fellows eat pork. So the problem is not only the feast, it's also a lot of the customs. Suddenly, their traditions were threatened. Okay? The way they do church was threatened. But somehow, there was a special grace upon the church of Antioch that, was, that wasn't evident in the church in Jerusalem, okay? And when you begin to study the book of Acts, what was so fascinating about the Antioch church was this, when you compare it with the Jerusalem church. 
The Jerusalem church received the Great Commission, but they never fulfilled the Great Commission. They were forced to fulfill the Great Commission. How? They got kicked out of Jerusalem <laughs> through persecution or otherwise. But Acts chapter 13 tells the story, Antioch church was a little bit different. They intentionally set time of fasting and praying and they sent out. And you know, when I made the study, it just speaks to me. God, how do we find our identity? Either you're forced to it, like in Jerusalem, or you embrace it, you choose it. And here is where my challenge to this church is. Don't be forced into it. But embrace, because this is who you are. And what happened is this, this entire missional drive, you will find it repeated again and again in history. Okay? The example of the Vietnamese church. Who are these crazy Americans, ah? Huh? They came all the way, and during those days, no, no Air Asia, you know. I take a flight to Hanoi, I mean, it's just three hours. Those days, where God? And then by the time they make their way there and go to this incredibly remote village, in the natural, is absolutely crazy. But yet, what we see in history, again and again, we have crazy people in the natural, but perfectly normal. Why? Because it's the Holy Spirit. Because it is something of their other identity that goes beyond the normal. It is who I am as a child of God. Now, this is repeated, as I was saying, in history again and again. Let me give an example. William Carey, the father of modern missions, okay? And it was said that when he was a young person, he went to his Baptist leaders and told them, we need to send the gospel to the Far East, to India. And according to the story, the church leaders tell him, young man, sit down. If it's God's will to save the Indians, God has got his own way. He doesn't need to send you. He rejected that. And he was so determined. Eventually, at the age of about just a little bit past 30, already married, he made his own way. He worked in the ship, worked for the East Indian Company, landed in Calcutta, and for the next 30, 40 years devoted his life to Sarampo. And before he died, I don't know how many Indian languages he mastered, including translating the Bible. What makes a person so crazy? It is because he doesn't only have a natural identity. It is he lived out what God has placed into him. Now, I study movements. I study how churches grow. Let me tell you another story. I sit on the committee for the AGST and BCM Doctor Ministry program and I meet some amazing people. And one of the, uh, some of you might know this group of churches called New Life Restoration, okay? Right now, they run something like about 50 over churches in Malaysia alone, okay? And overseas, they've got outreaches in Russia, in China, in, in Laos, in Cambodia. And how did it start? It was simply because of a bunch of Malaysian students whose families were rich enough to send them to study in Australia, Melbourne. And as one of them told me, when he went to study in Australia, because during those days, you know, in the late 70s, early 80s, because of the whole change of the NEP, it was tough. Uh, it was tough for uh, non-Malays. He said, he told his mom, Mom, I'm going to migrate and I'm not coming back. And so these guys studied in Australia, graduated, started working there. But as they begin to grow deeper in the Lord, God spoke to a small number of them, a handful, that says, no, 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 no. Life is not just about making it comfortable. They made the decision, God is calling us back to Malaysia. No full-time support, they came back as managers, they came back as an accountants, they came back as engineers, but they planted a church. 
In fact, one of the key church planters right now, he's my age. He was a full-time engineer, had his own company until four years ago. And all the time, church planting, pastoring. Why? Hey, are you telling me? Now, many of us here are working, right? Not? You're working, are not enough pressure. You want to tamba pressure. You want to add on pressure to what you're facing. But what drives them? The call of God. There's something inside that, oh God, life is more than just who we are in the natural. There's something beyond. And this story, actually, it's not unusual because, and these are not the old, only the old people, even until today, I end up meeting young people in their 20s and 30s actually choosing to relocate to different parts of the world because they sense the call of God where they need to work. They go to Oman, they go to UAE, they go to Dubai. And they rough it out. Why? Because something that God has spoken into their heart, that there are people groups there that need the gospel and this is what God is saying to us. And maybe let me just kind of end of story. When I think of G.D. Clang, your story started in the 1960s. Okay? With a couple of young bananas, <laughs> teenagers. And through this church, there have been scores of people that have gone full time. And even though it was initially an English congregation, but you branched out, you end up with Chinese, you end up with Tamil, and you've planted different congregations. But here is my challenge to you today Malaysia have changed since 30 years ago, 20 years ago. And I think the critical question that you and I and our young people here have to ask is this. What does it mean to be church at this time and hour today? What has happened has happened. We thank God. I am so proud to be born in Assemblies of God Church. But as far as I'm concerned, history is over. The question that we need to ask, what does it mean to be church? What does it mean to love God? What does it mean to be a missional person as a Chinese, as a professional? Would God be speaking to individuals among us? Would God be speaking to you and I? And I will say this, yes. Why? Because the Holy Spirit lives in you. You're not just a Chinese, you're not just, you're not just an Indian. You're not just a human being. You have the Spirit of God living in you. And today, as I bring this, and can I just very quickly ask for the worship team uh, to come forward? Uh, let's just prepare the song, Come Holy Spirit, Fall on uh, fall on me now. Can we do that? Now, to, you're going to be having Holy Communion very shortly. In the Holy Communion time, is a very powerful time of rededication. I will tell you why. Because when you partake of the bread, and uh, the bread and the wine, you know what you're saying? Jesus, I am taking you into my life. It is not just a remembrance. For me, Holy Communion is not just a remembrance of the death of Jesus, but it's also a renewed commitment. Lord, I embrace your life. Now, I do not have much time to share, but this is what I do believe. God is speaking to you. And some of the things that God is speaking to you, I didn't even speak it out. But the Holy Spirit has got a way of just dropping ideas and thoughts. Just simply asking you, and not just asking you, telling you, Lord, what does it mean to love you? What, it, what does it mean to live for your cause? Lord is giving money, but more than that. It is praying, 
but more than that, God is who I am, is how I live life. And I want to invite all of us right now to stand to our feet. Can we do that? Just come into the presence of God. There are individuals here that, even young people, God places dreams in your life, ideas, visions, directions. And even for the older ones, God would be saying to you, this is an area where you can contribute. It is about your context, your situation. God is not asking us to do something that we cannot do, but He has already created the situation in your life. Now, before we move to 